We feel your presence at a place called grace. Here you've given us this Sunday morning yes. that we can study a lesson once again. But most of all, Lord, that we can praise your name. Lift your name up on high. Oh, what a God we serve. Yes. Just thinking about you, Lord, causes so much love because you're God and God all by yourself. The things that you have done for us and continue to do for us is cause to say thank you, Jesus. Because you and you alone died on that old rugged cross. Had you not given up your life, we would never have a tree of life. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us this day. We thank you for this last day in the month of February as we celebrate Black History Month. We thank you, even though it's the shortest month in the year, Lord, we thank you. Because you do all things well. We thank you for allowing us to just come out one more time to just lift your name up on high. We thank you for a place called grace. We thank you for everyone that has come out this morning and those that might still be on their way and then those that are on this prayer line, Lord, we thank you for giving us this chance to be able to lift your name one more time. Because you're such an awesome God. And we thank you for our pastor in the way of one Ivory Jones the third. Continue to bless him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Whatever he might stand in the need of, Lord, and then his companion that stands by his side 24-7, Lord, we thank you. Because some 17 years ago, Lord, you blessed us with this family. We just thank you for an awesome pastor, Lord. Continue to give him what can only come from on high, whereby he might be able to feed his flock. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to stand boldly before you once again. As we look up, we feel your presence. We know all our help comes from above. And so we thank you for just giving us this time together. And whatever you would have this day to be, Lord, we know it to be blessed because you caused it to be so. Thank you. These blessings and all blessings we ask in your name and for your sake we pray. Amen. Amen.
we have, Lord. Yes, we have. And you know, um, every year we have celebrated Black History Month of February, and we know that we are black, and we have celebrated Black History all year long, all of our lives. That was a time when someone would call you black. That was a what? A fight. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That was another name they would call you that was a fight. But now we are black, Afro-American, African-American. We are some everything now because what? We realize that God has brought us a mighty, mighty long way. Amen. I just want to thank our pastor again, Pastor Ivy Jones. He worked so hard Amen. to do what we're doing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to give him thanks and give God praise for having this wonderful pastor. Yes, Amen. Yeah. Amen. You know what? He couldn't have done all of this without this lovely young lady that's standing yeah. beside him. Yeah. Sister Michelle Jones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By none other than our wonderful, handsome young man, Deacon Gary Hunter. <laughs> Give him a hand, y'all. <laughs> just for this day. So we welcome you to a place called Grace. If you look amongst yourselves, you can see this is a beautiful place. We love unconditionally at a place called Grace. And today is no exception. We're so excited that we have so many that have came out today to hear this program that's going to be put on for Black History Month. Yeah. We should never lose sight of where we are now versus where we used to be. And if you think about that for just one split second, look at what just happened not long ago. <coughs> Things have changed. We got new leadership. We got new direction. But to maintain those kinds of things, we have to do what we're doing now. Celebrate. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Deacon Hunter. You know, I, I, I know I threw him all when I said handsome. You know what I mean? He didn't realize he was handsome. Amen. He, just, he didn't know what to say. Amen. But thank God for our Deacon, Deacon Gary Hunter. Amen. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a reading by our Dean, Dean Stella Murphy. And I always call her my little piece of leather, well put together. That's, that's welcome, Sister Stella Murphy.
what we believed it was essential for young African Americans to understand and be proud of their heritage. Woodson chose the second week of February to coincide with the birthday of Frederick Douglass, a famed abolitionist who escaped from slavery and President Abraham Lincoln, who formally abolished slavery. It wasn't until 1976, during the height of the Civil Rights Movement, that President Gerald Ford expanded the week into Black History Month. For over 40 years, Black History Month has taken over the month of February to honor some of the greatest minds in our country and world. Though a month is certainly not enough time to commemorate all that black people have done for humanity, a continued engagement with history is vital as it helps to give context for the present. Every February, people across the nation come together for events and activities to celebrate Black History Month. It's a time for us to continue our collective journey of honoring and deepening our knowledge of the history and contribution of African Americans and people of Amer African descent that have been marginalized from mainstream curriculum. So this year, in 2021, let us continue to highlight the history, diversity, and achievement of our local black community and the black community nationwide. Thank you. Murphy, you know, we are learning a lot about, about our black heritage, especially in uh, the month of February. It makes us sing, makes us read, and just look up these different characters, old and new. Amen. Amen. And now we will have a solo. Uh, mm -hmm. Sister Velma Williams is supposed to be here today, but we all know Sister Velma Williams a little under the weather, even though she may come in a little later, but I have someone that's going to stand in for her, our wonderful first lady, Sister Michelle Jones. Amen. Now, right. you all know that Sister Michelle Jones, not only can she speak, she can sing as well. Amen. She's a lady of many talents. Amen. 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 So let's give her a hand as she comes forth. Amen. Sister Michelle Jones.
here's a young lady that's so faithful. She's our little youth superintendent. Yeah. She's always here. And I used to, I would say to Pastor Joan, I take my hat off to Sister Joan and Sister Olivia Higby because they are here almost every Sunday. Yeah. Every Sunday. Amen. Doing something, singing, Amen. praying, praising the Lord. Now let's welcome Sister Olivia Higby. She will be doing Harriet Tubman.
In, 19, in 1893, Dr. Daniel Hill Williams was the first heart surgeon. He was able to cut open someone's chest and sew it back together again. Heart surgery, as we know it today. Dr. Benjamin Carson, at the age of 35, separated conjoined twins at the head. A neurosurgeon became the first to develop the separation. Today, I am honored to talk about Dr. Kiznikia Shante Corbett, otherwise known as Kizzy. Born January 26, 1986, is an American viral immunologist at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. She earned a PhD in microbiology and an immunology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Appointed to the, Vi to the DRC in 2014, she is currently the scientific lead of the DRC's coronavirus team with research efforts aimed at propelling novel coronavirus vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccine. In December 2020, the Institute's director, Dr. Anthony Fauci, said, Kizzy is an African-American scientist who is right at the forefront of the development of the vaccine. In February 2021, Corbett was highlighted in the Time, Time 100, next list under the category of innovators with a profile written by Dr. Fauci. In the Times profile, Dr. Fauci wrote that Corbett has been central to the development of the Moderna mRNA vaccine and the Eli Lilly therapeutic monoclonal antibody that were first to enter clinical trials in the US and that her work will have a substantial impact on ending the worst respiratory disease pandemic in more than 100 years. Corbett was born in Hurdle Mills, North Carolina. In the fourth grade, her teacher said, I always thought she is going to do something one day. She got an I and cross T, the best in my 30 years of teaching. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Corbett started working on a vaccine to protect people from coronavirus disease. Recognizing that the virus was similar to severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, Corbett's team utilized previous knowledge of optimal coronavirus S proteins to tackle the novel coronavirus. To manufacture and test the COVID-19 vaccine, Corbett's team partnered with Moderna a biotechnology company to rapidly enter animal studies. Subsequently, the vaccine entered phase one clinical trial only 66 days after the virus sequence was released. Corbett has called for the public to be cautious and respectful of one another during the coronavirus pandemic, explaining that regular hand washing and sneezing into one's elbow can help to minimize the spread of the virus. She has also emphasized that we should not stigmatize people who may be from areas where the virus started. Corbett has worked to rebuild trust with vaccine, with vaccine hesitant populations, such as the black community. For example, she presented education about the COVID-19 vaccine development to Black Health Matters in October 2020. Her race has been a focus of government outreach after a study released by the NAACP and others revealed that only 14% of Black Americans believe a COVID-19 vaccine will be safe. The National Institute of Health Director Fauci was explicit. The first thing you might want to say to my African American brothers and sisters is that the vaccine that you're going to be taking was developed by an African American woman Dr. Kizia Kizmikia Corbett. Thank you. Amen. Isn't that good news? Yes, it is. It was developed by a black woman. Amen. Mrs. Dr. 
Dr. Corbett. All right. Got to be careful about how you pronounce these people's names. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Amen. So thank you again, Sister uh, uh, Barton. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you all can stand as these people come forward. <laughs> There's a president and the first lady of the United States of America. Thank you. during both of my campaigns. I want to thank Grace for opening his doors, not to tell people who to vote for, but to canvas the neighborhood in order to knock on doors, Deacon John Rice and others, who knocked on doors to tell people to get off their seat, get on their feet, hit the street, and get out and vote. Michelle, what do you have to say to us today? Okay, I am Michelle Robertson, and I grew up on Chicago's South Side, and I am the daughter of Marion, a homemaker, and Frazier Robertson, a worker in the city's water purification plant. I studied sociology and African American studies at Princeton University in New Jersey before attending Harvard Law School and then returning to Chicago, I took a job as a junior associate at Sidley in Austin, where I specialized in intellectual property law. In the year of 1989, while at the firm, I met this slender, tall young man <laughs> who goes by the name of Barack Obama. <laughs> And wouldn't you know it, I think they was trying to hook us up because they knew we both attended Harvard, and they allowed me to be his mentor to show him around the firm. Not just a coincidence, right? And I remember Barack when he first met me. He couldn't take his eyes off me. He just, you know, he saw how tall I was and how beautiful I was. But Barack, he was pretty suave and debonair, and some of the ladies at the office, you know, just thought he was so cute because he was very smart and brilliant. Although I was skeptical of it all, I found myself admiring him for two things. One, his self-assertiveness, and two, his earnest demeanor. Over the next couple of weeks, we spent a plenty of time together, didn't we? <laughs> and then one day, when you know it, he asked me out. And I refused because I thought it wasn't just appropriate for me to go out with him because I was your advisor. And then Barack said, well, I'll just quit my job since you don't want to go out with me. And then guess what? I gave in. And so we went out to the law firm's barbecue. And on the way home, because he didn't have a car anymore, I had to drive him. He said, come on, let's go to Baskin-Robbins and get some ice cream. So Barack convinced me to go to Baskin Robbins, and I tell you, he bought me this cup of chocolate ice cream, and it was just the best tasting ice cream I ever had. So when we we went and sat on the curb at Hyatt Park, and when we sat there, Barack asked me, could he have a kiss? And that was our first kiss, eating our Baskin Robbins ice cream, sitting on the curb at Hyatt Park. And guess what? They commemorated the kiss with a plaque right there on the curb in front of Baskin Robbins in remembrance of our first kiss. 
Right. And also they made a movie what a entitled Southside with You. And I am so proud to say that our life has took a journey, a journey, and I've just been trying to hold on because his career was moving so fast, I had to juggle family, children, and the White House. Yes. And because of that, I stand before you to say that I am a proud black woman who is in our black history because I was able to serve as first lady of the White House from 2009 to 2017. And then I, I, I wrote a book, Becoming Me. And in this book, you can find out everything about my life, my childhood, and my marriage to this wonderful man, our 44th president, Mr. Barack Obama. Michelle. Sasha and Malia will be proud of you today for how you outlined the tremendous connection that we made. But you missed out on one thing. We went to the movies. I took you to the movies, and, and Spike Lee had just put out that great movie, Do the Right Thing. And we went to see Do the Right Thing. And as the 44th president of the United States, an American politician and attorney who served as the 44th president from 2009 to 2017, a member of the Democratic Party. I was the first African American president of the United States of America. I previously served as U.S. Senator for Illinois from 2005 to 2008 and as an Illinois State Senator from 1997 to 2004, as the first African-American elected President of the United States, I, Barack Obama, became the pivotal figure in American history even before my inauguration. Yes, we were able to uh, use social media and use social platforms in order to raise monies and we didn't have to have a lot of money. We were getting $25 and $50 from individuals, millions of individuals who supported my campaign for change in America. But after winning the second term in 2012, my achievements in office made me one of the most transformative presidents of the past 100 years. I took office with the country in peril and led it through the Great Recession, two wars, civil unrest, a rash of mass shootings, and changing cultural demographics. In 2008, the campaign, I called for change, and eight years later, we are living in a more prosperous country because of it. And I wrote some books too, Michelle. I wrote, I wrote The Promised Land, I wrote The Audacity of Hope. I wrote The Improbable Quest. I wrote Yes We Can, you help me out on that one. And I wrote The World As It Is, as well as Dreams of My Father. I am Barack Hussein Obama, and this is what I do. Amen. Wait, we have a quiz. Hold up. Well, did you get your quiz? Everyone has a quiz. See how much you know about Barack Obama. Where was Barack Obama born? In Chicago, Illinois, and Luhania, Hawaii, in Washington, D.C., or in Honolulu, Hawaii? Honolulu. All right, Honolulu. Was it one year, two years? He never went there, or four years? Two years. He attended two Oxygen years. College. Two years. Barack Obama went back to school at, to Harvard Law, then started to work for the Harvard Law Review. What position did he reach at the end of his first year? Was he a writer, editor in chief, editor, or president of the journal? 
President of the Germans. What did Barack Obama graduate as when he did not graduate? Was he summa cum laude? Was he cum laude or magna cum laude? Magna cum laude. Was it in 93, 95, 94, or 92? 92. 92. Okay, we'll go to number seven. Michelle Obama, ask some questions here. All right, um, number seven. Michelle Obama was born on January 17, 1964. What major city in the United States was the city of her birth? Chicago. 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 Right. Number nine says one of Michelle Obama's careers was a lawyer in marketing and in intellectual property. Which notable school did Michelle Obama earn her lawyer degree from? Was it Texas A&M, Boston University, Notre Dame, or Harvard Law School? Harvard. Harvard. And then number 10. Michelle Obama became a notable figure in her city's government. Public, public services, hospitals, and colleges. Which one of these roles did she not serve in? Assistant Commissioner, Assistant to the Mayor, Chaplain of the City Board, Director of Relations for University Hospital. Say again. Assistant Commissioner for the City Development and Plan. Let's give it up for Michelle and Barack Obama.
this guy undercut him and he fell straight on his back and hit his head. And he lay there, that's something to see, you know, you 600 miles away and your son is laying on the floor and not moving. And uh, the glory be to God, he turned over. He got up. On his own, he got up. And he said he's just a little sore. Lord, I didn't talk to him this morning, but last night he said he's just a little sore. Okay. And uh, I told him to take some leave and go rest. <laughs> but anyway, um, our lesson is Lesson 13, which was showing generous hospitality, coming from Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 11 through 15, and verse 40, and 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 30. Our key verse for today's lesson was, when she was baptized in her household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, Acts 16 and 15. And before I go on, I just want to say um, to Deacon um, Salas, when you read your scripture this morning in devotion, it, it ties into what today's lesson is about. The things he read when he read in um, in Luke today. So I don't know if you the lesson made you do that or whatever, but it just shows you how God works. Um, so in the lesson, Paul was traveling to Macedonia with Philippi because he had got a vision to travel there. And it was always his custom on the Sabbath to preach at a synagogue. But when he arrived in Philippi, there was no synagogue there. The Jewish custom was 10 men had to be present in order to have a synagogue. I think they called that a quorum, I believe. But what he did find was several women down by the river praying, and one of them was Lydia. So in, to review today's lesson, what I'm going to do is just use the three lesson aims in our, uh, in our Sunday School book. To review the lesson. The first lesson, as a result of experiencing this lesson, we should be able to do three things. The first one is to consider how Lydia used her gift and her place in society to support Paul's ministry. Lydia was a businesswoman who sewed beautiful purple cloth. She was wealthy, and that was evident in that she cared. She had servants who cared for her, and she had a spacious home. Lydia's faith was, she was, she was faithful. Well, she worshiped God, but she became faithful and a believer after hearing Paul's preaching. She was uh, passionate in her spirit, and because of her passion, she told all her servants in her household about what Paul preached about, and they believed and were baptized as well. Now, Bible scholars suggest that Lydia was one of the founders of the Philippian church and the first convert in Europe. In support of Paul's ministry, she offered her home to Paul and his missionaries, and she persuaded them to stay at her home, which they did. And Lydia used her gift, which was her spacious home, to support Paul in his ministry. Even after Paul and Silas went away and went to prison, we all know the story, they were released. When they were released, they went back to Lydia's home. Our second aim is refers a lot to us, and that it asks that we repent of times that we may have looked down on others who have not had the same opportunities or advantages. And that comes from the second part of our lesson, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 30. In this passage of scripture, Paul had already encouraged the Corinthians not to be divided. They were all chosen by God, so they were all to be united in mind and thought. Paul also goes on to tell them that he, God chooses who he wants to choose. Yeah. And whoever he wants to choose, he chooses them so that they may do his work. Paul tells the Corinthians that God can empower anyone to do his will, and they should not be hung up on what they think their limitations might be. He also reminds those who have more advantages than others not to look down on someone that doesn't have the same advantages. 
The same holds true for us as believers today. If we look down on someone because we feel like we do more for God than the next person, mm -hmm. then we need to repent of those thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Those gifts and blessings can be taken away at a moment's notice. Yeah. So we have to thank God for our gifts and the ability to use our gifts and to use our gifts yeah. for the glory of God. Our last lesson aim was to serve others joyfully through whatever means are at their disposal. Lydia did that by offering her home to Paul and his missionaries. We as believers must use what we have at our disposal to help others as well. We never know how our hospitality and genuine concern for others can provide a door to open them to Christ. Or if they're, if they're a believer, and if they are a believer, it could result in a believer gaining a deeper understanding with Christ. So finally, I would like to read a paragraph from our lesson. It was on page, if you have the teacher's book, it was on page 98. I'm not sure if it was in the student book, but it's encouraging all believers to be a change agent. I call it a change agent. That's the term I gave it. By change agent, I mean that someone who is willing to work towards positive change. We need to get out of this every man for themselves mentality, and I've got mine, you get yours mentality. Yeah, yeah. And which is why I uh, uh, wore this t-shirt today, Good Trouble, which is a, a philosophy of Representative John Lewis, uh -huh. who we know we just lost in July. And his philosophy was real simple. He just said, if you see something wrong, do something, say something, get in trouble. Good trouble, necessary trouble. So that's just my little representation of Black History Month today. But the paragraph reads, as a body of baptized believers, we must make efforts to revive the original model of commitment and love demonstrated among believers in the early church. They shared freely among themselves and bridged economic disparities between individuals with hospitality. Across the years, our capitalistic culture has seen an ever-widening gap between the privileged and the impoverished. A departure from the close-knit extended family structure and a decline in mutual compassion and concern for others in the community. The rise of individualism has compromised the fabric of Christian love even in the church. Believers must commit themselves to a conscientious effort to demonstrate love to the world and show unity with those who share their common faith in Jesus Christ. And as I was thinking about the lesson this morning, our church covenant, which I haven't read, I'll be honest, I haven't read the church covenant since last March when we first Sunday, but it reminded me of the church covenant when it talks about how we should aid each other in sickness and distress and be kind and courteous in our speech. So our lesson this Sunday was to uh, remind us that we should show generous hospitality and use our gifts and talents wherever we can to please the Lord. Okay. Thank you for your time. Amen. Let's say amen again for Sister Karen Rockwell. Oh, we, we enjoyed that lesson on Wednesday night that she taught it and she lectured that lesson to us. Uh, all of us ought to let God use the Lydia in us. Use the Lydia in us. Amen. And the Bible is filled with character, with different personality, uh, specs and traits uh, that were useful for kingdom building purposes and business. And business. And I'm not going to attempt to reteach that lesson. She's done a wonderful job. But I would ask um, that you would note that Lydia had a gift. Uh, once you become saved, born again, you get a gift. You've got a package coming. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 says we're sealed to the day of redemption, but we also have a gift. And that gift is utilized not for us to be grandstanding, for us to be better than or better off. It's for us to be a blessing to each other and to honor and serve Christ. And what was Leah's gift? The gift of hospitality. The gift of helps. Amen. There's four categories of gifts. Speaking gifts, serving gifts, sign gifts, and spiritual gifts. And here she had this gift where she was hospitable. 
And if you've really been called by God, one of the first gifts you get, if you know you've been changed by God, is a gift of hospitality. Consider it of somebody else. Let's have any comments or questions to the lesson as we get ready to wrap it up. Any comments or questions to the lesson? Feel free. Amen. This is Sunday school. Amen. Well, we all got it. Lydia, Lydia is going to live on because she was hospitable and she opened the door. And then also, this concludes the series of how many lessons we have on women in ministry. We have five lessons on women in ministry in this particular quarter. And we're grateful for all of the women that the Bible said certainly were a great part of ministry and in uh, the work of ministry. We have to recognize that God tore down barriers. Uh, when Christ was risen up, he tore down barriers. And so we're grateful that all of us can be chosen and used by the Lord. Amen. Amen. Give God a praise. Amen. Also, we want to thank God for Sister Ramil Boykins, who is the Sunday School and Baptist Training Union President of the Union District Association. She did her address, her second address, on this past Friday right here, and we were so blessed by that word that she shared. Let's celebrate our director of Baptist Training Union and our president of our district, and she did a wonderful job. I want to thank those who came out to support her, and we ask that you continue to encourage her. And then yesterday, she hosted her first virtual school via Zoom. And when I went into the Zoom, they had the um, different, what you call them, modules, the different classes, breakout rooms, amen. They had the breakout rooms, and I was able to just click my class. And it was so tempting when you see all the classes to say, I'm going in all the rooms, amen. But, but I clicked my room along with uh, moderator Small, Michael D. Small is our moderator. He talked to pastors, and we had a wonderful time. We also want to send a shout out to uh, moderator Small, whose birthday is tomorrow, March the 1st. March the 1st is tomorrow. Tomorrow is March the 1st. I want to say happy birthday to moderator Mike D. Small as well. Back in the hands of our able and capable superintendent, Anything else? We had a hand here, Deacon Conti. Oh, my birthday is tomorrow. Oh, Deacon Conti Sutto's birthday is tomorrow, March the 1st. March the 1st, happy birthday. And as, as it comes on tomorrow, we celebrate all the birthdays. There's some more birthdays coming up. Amen. And our, our director, so the boy can celebrate her birthday last Sunday. Last Sunday, let's celebrate her. Amen. 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 So let us stand as we as we prepare to close out our Sunday school segment, and we'll be on Facebook Live for morning worship. We don't intend to hold you as we have commemorated Black History Month. We have come a long way, and we surely have a long, long way to go. But we know our God is faithful, and our God is able. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, come on church, I do Hello. 
Touch our children. Touch this new generation that they might be invigorated, illuminated, inspired, and that they might move forward walking hand in hand toward the goal of the prize of the high calling of God that's only in Christ Jesus. Let the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on. Bless God. 